short instructional video on the long essay question. And I'm going to attach a mini lecture to it as well on the Articles of Confederation, not Alexandro Ocasio-Cortez. That's not what AOC stands for here. Our goal is to learn how to write the long essay question in a push. Um, and then we're going to tie that into an actual project on writing a long essay question, which will be about the Articles of Confederation. So the purpose of the mini lecture is to introduce you to some of the major themes of the AOC to help your research efforts after we finish the mini lecture. Let's go ahead and start. An LAQ is nothing but an essay, so you've been writing those for quite some time. Um, it's just a chance to respond to a prompt that you're given. You respond with an argument, so a claim that you make, and then you're going to defend that claim with some evidence. In APUSH, the LEQ has six points. Um, first point is a thesis, so you need a claim. You need to be able to say, I am claiming that something. It's got to be a response to the prompt, um, and so you have to be on topic with what you're trying to say in your claim. You get one point for contextualization, which I often think of as sort of the background to the topic. Um, contextualization is often like an introduction. It eases your reader into the essay by saying, here's what you need to understand and know before I tell you my claim, my thesis, my argument. Um, so it helps situate that claim or that thesis in the appropriate context so that it makes sense to a reader. Um, the next two points, which are earned independently of each other, are for evidence. You get one point for merely citing relevant evidence. So if you talk about something that is relevant to the topic, um, that is a point. Using that evidence, though, to support your claim is another point. So I could mention a factual piece of material but if I never directly connect it back to my thesis and say, I'm using this evidence to prove my point, um, then you don't get the other point. So keep in mind, two points for evidence, one for citing relevant evidence, one for supporting that claim that you have with the relevant evidence. And two for analysis. This is where you get to think and act like a historian. You get to approach um, the historian's craft um, by thinking about causation, about change over time, about comparisons over time. But it's also a chance for you to be complex in your argument, to have nuance or subtlety, to recognize diverse points of view, multiple ways of thinking about a particular argument. The complexity point's probably the hardest to get because you can't earn it by simply just a sentence um, that you throw in or tack on. It's got to be built into your argument. You don't achieve complexity by just sprinkling a little bit on at the end. Um, there's got to be real evidence that you understand at a deep level you know, the issues and ideas that are in the topic of the paper. So essay um, for, is what an LEQ is. It's just an essay. Um, it's got these six points. Each point's earned independently. Um, and keep in mind, they don't take off points. So graders are not looking for excuses to take away from your grade. They look for excuses to give you credit for what you do right. Let's now talk uh, about the articles. And I'm going to actually model contextualization for you. The articles were created in 1777 um, by Congress, who uh, set a committee led by John Dickinson of Pennsylvania to come up with a government for the whole of the United States, to pull together all of the states. And out of that committee came the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union, not so perpetual because they didn't last as, as long as um, its founders would have wanted. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is not only were they written in the context of war, they're written in the context of responding to all the, the tyranny of Britain. So these 
Articles of Confederation are are written in such a way as to reject everything that the British had done to the colonists before the war. So they're written in a strong fear of centralized authority. They do not want to be dominated by a central um, authority power that um, will exercise control over the states because that's what Britain had done to them. So keep in mind that context and we'll help explain the actual structure of the articles. For example, every state had one vote, making every state equal, no matter how many representatives they sent to Congress. If you had five representatives, well, it doesn't matter. You still only get one vote. That means Rhode Island is every bit as powerful as Virginia, even though Virginia has way more people than Rhode Island does. Uh, to make this system work, on the basis of equality was an intention. It's not a flaw. It is an actual feature of the system of government. Because once again, they're afraid of tyranny and they don't want minorities like Rhode Island to be oppressed by majorities. It did make passing laws difficult because you needed nine of the 13 states to agree on passing a law. And if nine out of 13 states um, you know, are not in, you know, they're not able to achieve that agreement, uh, then making laws go into effect is going to be difficult if just a small handful of states say, no, we don't like a law. There were some laws that were passed that are actually pretty important um, because they're still with us um, in the United States today, um, still on the books. And they shaped, of course, the settlement of the United States. And I'm talking about the land ordinances of the West, 1784, 1785, and 1787. These set up the, the parceling out of Western lands, how those lands would be divvied up and organized, and the process by which those Western lands would become states. So this is actually pretty remarkable that the Congress under the AOC agreed three times, got nine out of 13 states to agree on land ordinances for the West. However, in other areas, there was not so much success. For example, the Articles of Confederation had no president, no judiciary. These would be things that would be powerful and would remind them of British control. So no on the judiciary, no on the president, no executive power. But that also meant that the AOC couldn't resolve conflicts or enforce its own laws. The only way to enforce its laws was to simply ask the states to obey and to be kind to each other. Um, in the opening sections of the Articles of Confederation, they actually describe this new nation as a firm league of friendship. And you and I both know that friends don't always agree, and at some point there needs to be a way of making sure that there is a decision to be made, um, because it could be easily, you know, result that friends might just break apart. Um, and that, in fact, was a real fear by the late 1780s, when many people in the United States thought that the whole Confederacy would just simply drift apart because their firm league of friendship was not holding. It could not also be amended, which meant that it would be difficult to change the Articles of Confederation should they need to, to meet some national emergency or, or you know, problem that they faced. It required unanimous consent. And that is a very difficult thing to achieve, to get everyone to agree. These are all features of the structure of the AOC that while they respond to real fears about Britain, also set up difficulties for the future for these states because the states have to work together, they have to cooperate, they have to be nice to each other, they have to be friends, this firm league of friendship, and the reality is they weren't. That's going to create some real problems by the late 1780s.
Here's some illustrations of the settlement of the West. You can see that people are definitely moving to the West in this time period. So they're showing up in, uh, this would be Tennessee down here, Kentucky, large number of folks in Kentucky, Southern Ohio right here. These are original proposed names. Um, so interestingly enough, we could have Metropotamia, Washington, Polypotamia, Asinisipia, what a mouthful that was. Um, thank goodness these names are not our state names today. And the system of land ordinances set up under um, the Articles of Confederation, 1784, 85, and 87, um, impacted the settlement of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois dividing the area up into grids, a grid system, um, setting off sections of those grids for schools, um, providing for an orderly settlement of the West. The thing though I think it's important for us to remember is that the West was not empty. There are people out here in the West and they are looking at um, Americans and going, we live here, this is our land. So America is claiming this territory in a way erasing the um, occupation that already exists out here by native peoples. It presupposes that one day all of this will be settled by white Americans and the natives will be gone. Economically speaking, the 1780s are a mess. First of all, states tax each other's exports. Um, so they're not cooperating economically. They're actually, in a sense, abusing each other. Every state has multiple currencies. They have different values. Uh, so it is an economic mess in the 1780s. People are trying to cheat other people, uh, using cheap currency from one state to pay debts in another state. Lawsuits are starting to pile up uh, between people um, from one state to another state, but you can't sue that state. Um, you have to go into that state and file a lawsuit inside the state against the person who's, you know, passing off cheap currency. It is just messy. There's an economic depression that's going on. Britain floods American markets with goods, increasing debts in the late uh, 1780s, between 1785 and 1789. Um, Americans hadn't been able to buy the things that they loved from England during the war, but now that they can, they're going into debt for them. And that wouldn't be a problem if Americans could sell their produce. But one of the things that Britain does is it forbids colonists to sell, or Americans now, I guess we can't say the colonists anymore, can we? Um, it forbids Americans, who used to be colonists, to sell products to the West Indies. So um, Britain is very much not willing to uh, continue trading with the United States in the way that it had done um, in the former days when Americans were colonial subjects. So you're in debt buying British goods you also can't sell things to the West Indies like dried smoked fish, uh, lumber, rice, or food to make money to pay those debts. And then on top of all that, the Articles of Confederation itself can't make any money. The AOC does not have the power to tax because once again, this is a government reflecting on the British experience and saying, well, the British tried to tax us. We don't want the AOC to do that. So the Articles of Confederation cannot in any way, shape or form, get money to pay its bills. So it cannot pay for um, the Revolutionary War debts. It can't pay its soldiers. Those soldiers are so angry about uh, their payment problems that they start talking about a military coup of the United States, the so-called Newburgh Conspiracy in 1783. And that 
is narrowly averted by George Washington appealing to them and their patriotism and saying, you know, please give the government a chance. We will get this figured out. Do not overthrow the government now. So economically speaking, the 1780s are a mess um, that's not easy at all for Americans to be successful and prosper in the wake of winning this war. Diplomatically, it's also a problem. England, for example, refuses to accept our diplomat. England refuses to take its troops out of the Western forts. Uh, there are difficulties over uh, enforcing the Treaty of Paris. So England says that they're not gonna enforce the Treaty of Paris. There are all kinds of problems between Americans and England, and you would expect that. England having lost the war is, is a bit salty about that. But also, you have to consider, too, that America is a winner of the conflict, but not necessarily a strong nation yet. Um, in fact, America is perceived as weak, disorganized, chaotic, and completely mismanaged. So many nations do not view the United States as a, as a strong you know, contender for world uh, participation in world politics. And in fact, one of the US allies even takes advantage of America's weakness, and that was Spain. The Spanish had contributed to the American Revolution. For example, um, before the Battle of Yorktown, um, Spanish citizens in Havana, Cuba, had collected 500,000 pesos to help fund the American and French efforts to beat the British at Yorktown. So Spanish citizens had contribute, contributed to the American war effort. But after the war, Spain does not see America as a strong power. And that comes to be a problem in the Jay Gardoqui Treaty of 1786. John Jay is a United States um, citizen from New York, uh, politician famous later as a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, he gets to play the role of diplomat with the Spanish minister, Don Diego de Gardoqui. And he's, the guys are sitting down to talk about an issue that's important to Americans, and that is access to the Mississippi River. Now, John Jay is told his one job is to get access to the Mississippi River. John, this is your job. Get access to the Mississippi River. Repeat after me, John. Do we need to like pin a note to your shirt? Get access to the Mississippi River. What's so important about the Mississippi River? It is how Westerners and Southerners get their produce to New Orleans to then be able to ship it into the world. And they need access to the river in order to do that. The Spanish have actually been confiscating Americans' um, goods when they're sailing down the Mississippi. It happened to a North Carolina resident in the uh, mid-1780s. And so there's definitely tension there. Southerners want it, Westerners want it, and Jay is supposed to get it. So Jay goes and negotiates, get access to the Mississippi River, get access to the Mississippi River. Comes back with a treaty. Look, guys, I got our treaty. Woo! In the treaty that Jay got, he actually gave up access to the Mississippi River for 25 years in exchange for a commercial treaty with Spain. Mind blown. You had one job, John Jay. While a commercial treaty would have helped Northerners, and certainly Northerners were okay with it, Southerners and Westerners lost their religion over Jay negotiating for the opposite of what he was told to do. So the treaty is rejected, and there's all kinds of talk about disunion and the country going apart because um, this northerner did not look after southern interests. Socially, there are some positive developments in the 1780s. Um, though neither of these are caused by the Articles of Confederation, they're neither hint, uh, you know, supported by nor hindered by. Um, so keep in mind these social developments that we're talking about here um, just happened in the 1780s. 
Uh, one is that northern states ban slavery. Um, not all of them ban it immediately, some gradually, so it will end over time. But many northern states, under pressure from African Americans, get rid of slavery in their constitutions and say that we will no longer support the owning of human beings. Another development in this time period is women get a development in rights called Republican motherhood, which says that women should be allowed to get an education because it will make them better mothers to raise better children for the growth of the American Republic. So women need to be able to learn so they can teach their children what it is to be an American citizen. Now, I know that sounds like positive because yay for education, yay for giving women a role in the public, right? We're embedding into the public a role for women to have to you know, perpetuate all the values of, of American Republican uh, ideas. But at the same time, it says that that woman's value is only because she's a mother. That is, motherhood is the key to her getting an education, not that she's intrinsically worthy of an education. So there are a lot of finishing schools and boarding schools established for young girls to teach them all the values. And of course, they teach Republican values and things like that, patriotism, etc. But they also teach sewing and dancing and cooking and playing the piano and French and things that are considered, you know, important for ladies to know. Keep in mind, these schools would not have been um, available for working class women. In the realm of social, this also could be political and economic, we have a rebellion. Shays' Rebellion, Daniel Shays. So yes, it is Shays's, which I never remember when I'm typing. I always just want to do Shays with the apostrophe, but it is, it is actually Shays's. Um, this rebellion occurs in Massachusetts, where uh, farmers were having to pay very high taxes in a time of depression. And they're paying them because Massachusetts wants to pay off its Revolutionary War debt. So it's like, we're going to tax you until we pay off this debt. And the farmers are saying, we don't have money. The economy has crashed. And many of these farmers are actually about to lose their farms. They're um, not able to pay their taxes, so they're about to lose everything. And they're sitting there thinking, why in the heck did I fight in a revolution over taxation and now Massachusetts, Taxachusetts, is about to take everything I've got? So for them, it seems to make no sense that um, they are facing losing all of what they have earned um, after just fighting a war over taxation. So they rebel, they shut down courts, they start to march on the government of Massachusetts, and Massachusetts does end the rebellion with help from the other states. The other states have to do voluntary contributions to put down the rebellion in Massachusetts. But this triggers a real serious discussion about what if this happens in other states? What if other states have disorder, chaos, and revolution. And that leads to America going up in flames. And this whole winning the war for freedom and liberty is just ruined. So these national leaders say, we need a stronger government in case this ever happens again. The AOC is not strong enough to save us. We need a better government. Defenders of the AOC say, no, you guys are exaggerating. The AOC protects states' rights. We put down the rebellion, didn't we? Yeah, some other states had trouble too, like South Carolina or Rhode Island. Yes, we know there's some social dislocation and disorder and chaos, but you know, give it time. The AOC will work out. And this debate is eventually going to lead to getting rid of the Articles of Confederation. Um, which will be a story we'll take up in our next unit.
Here's a map showing northern states um, ending slavery. You can see that the, the northern states from Pennsylvania, Ohio, et cetera, so on and so forth, um, all do this within the 1780s time period. Um, but the blue states in particular are gradual, so they're not going to be an immediate end to slavery. Ohio and Indiana end it as part of the Northwest Ordinance. Those ordinances passed under the AOC. The green states retain the enslavement of human beings. They do allow for individual manumission, so you can set free someone, but typically it's got to be for very meritorious services like you, you know, fought to save your master's life during the war. Um, in many places, it's expected, too, that you will move out of the state. So it doesn't indicate that you're welcome to remain and be a part of that state's social and economic and political world. Here is um, the Manumission Society of New York, um, a water pitcher that they have. And actually, John Jay belonged uh, to this group. Um, you can see here they're reflecting light, um, liberty, uh, bringing freedom to the shackled uh, person here, the enslaved person here. And this on this pole here is known as a liberty cap. It's a reference to ancient Rome. Over here, we see someone who was formerly enslaved learning to read. So definitely a difference between the North and the South, and we know where that's headed, don't we? folk song from the 1780s about Daniel Shays. Um, you can see from the lyrics that the author is not particularly fond of Shays. Um, the tune is in A minor, so it goes like this. My name was Shays, and in former days in Pelham I did dwell, sir. But now I'm forced to leave that place because I did rebel, sir. But then along comes the Constitution, and we get honored bold fathers rescuing us from revolution. Um, so imagine the last verse they probably changed maybe to major. Um, who knows how they would have sung it. Oh, then our honored father sat with a bold resolution and framed a plan and sent to us of noble constitution. Pickerty third, woo, right? 